All right, here we go. Now, this is Cheryl, and without further ado, please give a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you very much for being here. I, I think the introduction might be longer than the talk. It was going to be at first a Q&A and then a talk, and then I heard later a speech, and I started getting more worried and walked around the block. But anyway, uh, I, I have a few uh, vignettes I'd like to share just briefly that might inform uh, a bit about the work and what I've been trying to do uh, for most of my life. But uh, the, the idea of the name of the show, The Stillness of Time, is sort of a funny uh, play on words, you know, stillness, you know, we're still here, I'm, I'm still, what's, you know, be still. So it's a word, the words are funny. Words don't get you everywhere you need to go. And imagery and inanimate objects sometimes do take you places that words can't. Um, you know, words are, it's a symbol language that tries to describe emotion in us. And it, it does, a, it's the only thing we have to work with, but it's, it's the best thing we have to work with to, for a common denominator, but the visual and the music, sounds of music, these kinds of things are older than say, than say words exactly. So the stillness of time, time itself is a question mark. I think of Augustine, uh, first or second century to third century uh, Roman in Hippo in North Africa, a Roman province, but this is the height of the empire. And Augustine was a, was a great pivotal figure, and he said many funny things, as well as all the religious foundations he laid. They said, like time, I, I know what time is until you ask me to put it into words. And he talked about the past and the present being always here, the present, the future never here. The past was, but it's the present, it's like an eternity. So time uh, for, for Augustine was something, for the first time in intellectual history, someone thought about time as something outside of just using it as a part of the language. Like, well, what time is it? Or I'm going to be here next time. Or, or the seasons, like in Ecclesiastes, a time for this, a time for that. But this is the first person that brought it out and thought, what is the nature of time itself? And we still don't quite know, do we? So we're working on that. So the inanimate objects, Sometimes they exist like we exist, and we're just, the, we're temporal people. We are passing through, but it, it informed me. When I was a kid, I went to the National Gallery of Art, and I saw people smiling at paintings and looking at things, and realized that moment that those people are just passing by. But that Rembrandt painting has been talking to people for 500 years or 400 years, and that's so that that inanimate object is, is existing. It shares existence with us, the animate, but that it somehow may be on a different plane of, ex of experience. And it certainly slowed time. It slowed time down. People stop and look. So I thought maybe I would try to, you know, get that in my work as I, if I was going to be a painter. I was thinking about that at the time. So uh, I bought a, a, a pet rock with me. This is when I was a kid, I found this rock. And I think you could probably see a face in it. And it, uh, it provoked me, you know, to think, you know, I don't know why, but I knew it was a very old rock, millions of years probably. There's a shell fossil in there, which is the eye. And I just never can get over it, you know. So it's like an inanimate object, but whenever I look at this, I smile or I think, wow, you know, I, I, time just goes away, whatever time is. And I'm back to that point when I picked it up off the ground somewhere. So that, that teases me out of all thought as doth eternity, which uh, John Keats said. Now John Keats, this was another vignette, he happened to be in England about 200 years ago and was giving birth, helping to give birth to the Romantic movement, which is the idea that we don't know everything anymore. We're not so certain. And we, the joke is, I'm usually right, but I'm always certain. You know, you know, we hear that in politics, you know, um, <laughs> people are certain about their certainty, but they're not necessarily always right. But anyway, Keats um, was lucky enough that he, he knew this group of people, Wordsworth and, and Shelley and Byron, 
and uh, Lord Elgin. Now, I was an art history teacher. I used to always say Elgin, the Elgin marbles. I never, I always mispronounced it. And about a year ago, I, I looked it up and, and it's Elgin. So anyway, the Elgin marbles were saved by Lord, Lord Elgin in the uh, 1700s. There was Turkey and Greece were beating each other to death for no whatever apparent reason, who knows. But the Parthenon was, was still in perfect repair at the time. It had survived for 2,000 years because it was so perfectly beautiful. And these stone sculptures and people will go and say, oh my God, look at that. Look at these marbles, these people, you know, these giant um, gods and goddesses. And they were perfectly wrought and beautifully wrought by Phidias and Praxiteles and these guys. And they were a, a compass point for humanity. But the Greeks and the Turks were having a war and they were blowing up. They stored, they stored um, powder in the Parthenon and you, many of you know the history, and a, shot, a mortar shot hit and blew the roof off of it and tore it all to pieces. But it still exists as a ruin, but the frieze was still there. The, these figures were up in there. So Lord Elgin, now he's a criminal, you know, because he went and culturally appropriated these marbles, but really he saved them. Excuse me. And he brought them back to England. And uh, who is one of his buddies is John Keats, this great poet. And this funny little side story I recently came across is that he stored the, the marbles in, in a little greenhouse um, on his estate and let Keats come in there. And so John Keats would go in <laughs> to this greenhouse filled with all this Greek statuary that no one had ever seen and was by himself. So he stood still before it. At the time, <laughs> Keats was just having a moment. I can only imagine what came of that. And he was, of course, Keats was to die at 26 years old, but he was one of these incandescent you know, geniuses of poetry. And he wrote uh, the Ode on a Grecian Urn and talked about his experience. Really, he was talking about that. He said there's a little vase here, and he saw little pictures of Greeks doing certain things. You know, there's a little empty city, and there's, a, uh, there's somebody about to kiss somebody. And he, he looked at that, but really he was talking about the Elgin Marbles. And because it moved him so much to be in the presence of this of these stones, basically, which were never going to change, he realized that, and he knew he was. So anyway, um, he you know lines in that poem "Ode on a Grecian Urn." You know, it's the idea that the the idea again, the first time that the inanimate object exists with us, on an equal ground at least, maybe superior, because we're just passing through. We're, we we know what's going to happen, but. So time, you know, uh, time writes no wrinkles on thine eyes or brow. Since as dawn's creation beheld thee, thou rollest now. Now that's, that's a romantic poet, Byron, talking about the ocean. Time writes no wrinkles on thine azure brow, the blueness of the ocean. Since as dawn's creation beheld thee, thou rollest now. It's always going to be, it's like the respiration of the planet. And then Keats wrote, after, looking, after spending days in contemplation with these marbles, he wrote, you know, uh, uh, what did he write? Bold lover looking for your kiss. You know, he's, there's this picture of this guy reaching for the kiss of the fair maiden, and, and he can't quite reach it because it's, it's, it's trapped in an image. And, and so it's never going to happen. He's never going to get it. And, and they're never going to find their love. But he says... Fear not, you know, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. So it just kills you, you know. The way that he, he could see, um, you know, the permanence of that, even though it didn't actually happen. It was at the moment of, of potentiality, you know. So in, in paintings, I'm trying to keep those kinds of things in mind. I try to think of something that would be an interlocking inevitability of color, you know, that somehow shapes that seem like they have to be that way. And the color has to be that way. And it re remind us emotionally of states that, that we have, that come to us in dreams. So I'm not trying to make anything that's uh, too particular. You know, as, they say, as, you, as you gain the particular, you lose the infinite. So that's why poetry is so cool, because you can read a book, and there's all this crap in a book, all this da-da-da-da-da-da, and she did this, she did that. And the, but in a poem, you've got to really use the language and, and just pair everything away, and just this essence comes through. So at the end of Keats' poem is, When old age this generation shall wait, 
shall waste. Thou shall remain in midst of other woe, a friend to man, who shall proclaim beauty, truth, truth is beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. So this is coming from a 26-year-old genius, and he quickly died after that. But that's, that's the kind of movement that happened because he was made to stand still. So time, to me, I've discovered later in life is that if I don't do anything all day long, Time goes by so nice and slow. If when I start moving through space and start doing things, time just goes away. It just goes away. So to be still before something, it says that in the Bible, be still and know that I'm the Lord. But to be still or by the still waters. You know, stillness is an important visual uh, concept for us to entertain, to keep us healthier, I think, rather than to be so turbulent, you know. So... Um, <coughs> I could go different directions with it, but I, I just, I, when, I was, when I was 10 years old, about the time I found this rock, I built a stone wall in the woods with some friends of mine in the woods in D.C., which is a beautiful park, Fort DuPont Park, Fort Davis Park, and it's exactly the same as it was, and this is 55 years ago. But they, the park is not going to be touched because it's just, you know, it's preserved. It was an old Civil War fort, but it's maybe two square miles of real estate right in southeast Washington. And I went in there and with some friends, with one friend in particular, Donald Freeman, and we built a stone wall about 20 or 30 feet long, worked really hard on it for two or three days. I don't know why. We were building a defense or something. You know, they were, they were going to get us and we were going to play guns or whatever. And I built this stone wall. And, uh, at, you know, and then I've, we left and we moved. But I've forgotten about it. But I, every once in a while I remember, yeah, I built that wall back there. And my brother and I about two years ago went back to D.C., with bicycles on our cars and decided we would ride around the neighborhood like we were kids in the same, and the neighborhood's the same. And we went out into the woods and you could see places where three forts had been built, but there used to, you know, there used to be like rusty nails and things. Everything's gone like that. That's all time has taken care of that. Life has. But the stone wall we came across and it's right there. Exactly. <laughs> it just, it just blew me away. I tell you, I was choked up. I mean, it was like, it was like, I had, my parents called me in to get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something. <laughs> and 55 years later, I came back out to the stone wall. And my brother and I were just freaking out. It was just really cool. But that, that time was still there and that, at that place. And it's still there. And I don't think it'll be wrecked. But um, anyway, I'm trying to get those kinds of, those kinds of feelings to happen in a, in a visual arrangement. And that's, that's the idea of, about what I'm trying to do. This painting is Inlet Dawn, and I'm uh, trying to put across the idea of hope or possibility, trying to uh, show the feeling of uh, it's been very dark, but then there's these really nice colors that present themselves uh, at some point in dawn or the evening. So I'm interested in that time of the day because it uh, like maximizes possibility. Something's about to happen, beginning of the day or the end of the day. Okay. In this painting, I'm trying to show uh, like the, the, the heat and the glare of an ocean, uh, ocean day, sort of an evanescence or sort of an atmosphere starting to just emerge, like a cloud just emerges and catches the light in the scene, like a lampshade does. It uh, uh, somehow does that, it reflects back up and down, and there's this sort of uh, uh, special effect that, that the natural world presents itself to us. And you forget once again that it might be an ocean or anything, it's just that there's these various visual phenomena happening and taking place. And that's what I'm trying to get across there. This is Mount Vernon Fields, this painting. And uh, it reminds me, uh, I grew up in Alexandria in DC area and Mount Vernon's a beautiful place to visit, but along the way down the Mount Vernon Parkway, there's this, you get these glimpses of the Potomac River. And it's completely separate from any of the historical aspects, but it's just simply a beautiful landscape. And uh, there's these flat lands that you can see the river poking, you know, peeking through. And uh, I just think it's, you know, sort of um, very, you know, it's a very, uh, uh, what's the word, provocative sort of visual arrangement that makes you think of something much longer than the here and now. You know, you see this ancient, it's like an ancient river. And it's been there, these are East Coast rivers are very old, you know, the, like the Appalachian Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains. They're some of the oldest features on Earth. And I think that it's really cool to see, uh, see that right here where so much history happened. 
So I've re returned to this theme many times. And, you know, Mount Vernon is a resonant, resonant thing. We all know what Mount Vernon is, but just to see it as the landscape and forget about the history. Just the landscape is what the eternal aspect would be, rather than, you know, the fact that a country was founded here, which is also very nice. But this is also um, a painting that uh, uh, is on one of the invitation pieces or the use for advertising, and it's an image that I'm particularly uh, drawn to. It reminds me of an old Western show. I was actually watching Shane on television and saw the uh, scene when he rides into town for the showdown, and uh, this was reminiscent of that to me. So, uh, and then there's a suggestion of a path going into a deep space. So I, I like the evocation of that, of the possibility once again, but there's something uh, portentous, not pretentious, but portentous, hopefully, about to happen. This painting's a little different, Maple Pond. I'm trying to get across an idea here of uh, uh, solitude and repose, like by still waters. Like still waters are a place where you can, uh, you know, be still and know that the Lord is here or something. I'm trying to just have that sort of elemental, primal uh, sense of beginning, like a spring kind of a thing. But uh, it's a series I'm working on right now, which is just simply an isolated tree blasting out its color at you, and not thinking that it's a tree, but just that it's giving up. A, a, um, a, a color for you to uh, enjoy. Yes, that's great. A big prospect for that. Did you tell the, you, you tell me the name of this? This is Maple Pond. I can do this. Uh, this painting is uh, called Evening Dream, and I'm trying again on this particular painting to. Uh, get an idea of a, a memory of a road, a, uh, a poetic idea of a road less traveled or an old, an old road, an old path that may be like an old pathway in one's life, you know, something that was from long ago. So it's sort of a memory, but I want the path to lead to a, to a certain destination that would be pleasing for the viewer. Interlocking shapes, you know, that seem to be inevitable. As again, okay. This painting, Horizon Dawn, is again um, trying to illustrate or trying to bring forth the idea of something's about to happen, and whether it's a dawn or an evening, uh, not so sure. But I did call it dawn. It's hopeful, red sky at dawn, you know that kind of thing. But uh, I just want the idea of almost forgetting the fact that it, it's a landscape, but just that these are color marks and these these are. These are things that resonate uh, in the viewer, rather than they being in a particular place. Yeah. This painting is Iron Shar Evening. I'm just trying to get an idea of deep space and an inviting space, where that if you were sitting here, you may, um, you may want to go way back into this distance and see what's in that distant field. Also, I'm trying to get a feeling that the viewer is elevated or floating themselves, so that you're not really grounded, you're not really standing there. You might be 20 feet off the ground, sort of in a memory. So I'm trying to get the idea of it being, um, you know, not necessarily rooted in the here and now, but that there's a possibility of something else that might hint at something beyond. What's the name of it?